welcome Senior Associate for Highland Associates, Bridget Gordia. Hi everybody, I'm Bridget Gordia. I'm with Highland Associates. We're an architectural, engineering, and interior design firm located in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. We also have an office in New York City and Miami. We work across multiple markets, healthcare, education, retail, government, public, uh, commercial office. And I'm so happy that we are a sponsor for today's event and to introduce my friend, Lisa. Lisa is a registered nurse, nutrition counselor, and community educator for health, wellness, mindfulness, and nutrition. She is a diplomat of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and certified lifestyle medicine professional. Since 2003, Lisa has been the owner of Lifestyle Management, where she provides private and group nutrition counseling and educates clients on the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Plant predominant nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, social relationships, and avoidance of risky substances. For the past 18 years, Lisa has, has worked as a private contractor for the University of Scranton and as a health and wellness professional. Currently, she is teaching mindfulness meditation classes and mindfulness meditation classes for faculty, students, and staff provided by the University of Scranton's Center for Health Education and Wellness. Lisa is a certified mindful eating conscious living teacher and certified mentor through UC San Diego. Lisa is a qualified teacher of mindfulness-based stress reduction through the Center of Mindfulness at UMass Medical School and the Mindful Center at Brown University. She teaches the eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course and eight-week mindful eating conscious living course to the community. She regularly teaches drop-in mindful classes in person and online. Lisa is a regular speaker of mindfulness for corporate groups, physician and healthcare professionals, and the community. Her passion is to help people gain awareness and empower their own optimal health and well-being. Lisa received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Delaware and her Master's Degree from Marywood University in Sports Nutrition and Exercise. So welcome, Lisa. Appreciate that. So that is a long, giant bio <laughs> that just goes on and on. But the reality is I'm a human being like you all are. So if we can just strip that away, I will come with some information for you today. But the reality is I come with the same stressors, the same challenges, the same issues that we all do. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. We're actually going to practice together. So we'll be doing some formal and informal practice. So with that, if you can silence or uh, turn off and take off your person, your weapons of mass distraction. Um, it's helpful, I'm actually gonna take mine off as well because the potential for one of my adult babies to call in the middle of something is pretty common. So I'm gonna take that off. So I'm gonna be talking today, I'm, the title of the uh, workshop today is Learning to Surf the Waves of Life. And the reality of this is all of us have to deal with different challenges and the metaphor of a wave, <clears throat> excuse me, the metaphor of a wave might be a common thing. So, you know, if you've ever gone to the uh, beach and you get into the ocean and it's up to your knees, not so bad. Things kind of are a little rocky. That's kind of like when you get a text that's a little annoying perhaps, kind of look down and it's like, uh, not sure that I want to deal with this right now. Or you step a little bit further out into the ocean and you start getting jostled around a little bit. And that might be something that's greater, more of an issue, maybe doing a lecture in front of a group of people. Or that could be getting sucked under the wave maybe for some. Um, or something that's really deep and difficult, a loss, a tragedy, economic challenges, any kind of issues that would be really, really difficult to deal with, maybe caregiver issues, or the collective trauma that we all just experienced for the last two years of COVID. Each one of these things is part of our lives that we cannot walk away from. Maybe it's a health diagnosis, for example. We can't get away from these things. They are part of who we are. 
And so how do we bring some way of well-being to our lives? One of the ways is through mindfulness. Mindfulness is a practice, not a perfect. And so you'd be practicing mindfulness, meditation particularly, regularly. Today, I'm actually going to do a little practice with you, and we're going to interact a bit. And then at the end, I'm actually going to give you some basic um, strategies. They aren't formal practices of mindfulness. However, they are practices that you could do anytime, anywhere, so that you could utilize them regularly. Okay. And then I'll leave time for questions, if you so wish, at the end. And then I'll also be available afterwards if, if you're interested in that as well. And so does this look familiar to anybody? Yeah? Noticing that the dog actually is there. He sees the trees. He sees the landscape. He sees the sunshine. He's all about that. And then there's the mind full, which is most of us as human beings. We're filled with thoughts, many, many thoughts each and every day. And thoughts are thoughts. Thoughts aren't facts. Okay, so we can question our own thoughts. Now, our thoughts are helpful, right? They give us di discernment and wisdom and judgment, allowing us to shift and change and take care of ourselves on a regular basis. However, when they start to run into overdrive, which happens quite often, it can be really, really stressful. It can put us into this place of stress. And so how do we begin to determine how to take care of ourselves from moment to moment to moment? And that is through awareness. I'm going to use the words interchangeably today. If mindfulness doesn't resonate for you, if it has a connotation, if there's a conception there that you have about it, let it go. And just notice that awareness is the way of being that allows us to start to settle and to calm ourselves. Through practice, yes, but also, too, just to be aware of who we are. In mindfulness meditation and mindfulness practice and in the eight-week program of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction course that was created at UMass Medical School over 40 years, and there's a great deal of research out there. I'm not going to bore you with research, although I am a super geek, so I like the science side of it. So I might give you a little bit here and there. But this practice, actually, we know in science, actually starts to rewire the brain. These well-worn grooves that we have laid down over time in our own stress habits, our own reactive patterns. So for example, if you did get a call from somebody that you really didn't want to take their phone call, what do you notice starts to come up in your physical body? Right? You get tight in the chest, maybe. Your stomach might start to turn. Your thoughts might start to go. A sense of anxiety might rise. You might start to notice sweaty palms, the heart race. Many things happen in our physical body. The beauty of being aware, dropping out of this filled head is to drop into the body. What's interesting about this is our minds loved to teleport to the past. So we do R&R &R oftentimes. If you ever had a conversation with somebody, we call it R&R, &R, which is basically review and regret. So you go back into the past and you try to replay it and figure out how, what you're going to say next and what you're going to do. Or you time travel into the future. And if you're somebody who time travels into the future, it's worry thinking, it's anxiety, trying to control everything that happens in the future, worry, worry, worry. And then half the time, the things that you're worried about never actually come to pass, right? So this is part of this understanding what the mind does. But it's normal and natural and OK. However, the body is always in the present moment. Our bodies are always in the present moment. It's this innate quality of being that we have where we can actually tap into our own physical sensations of the body to recognize, oh, yeah, I'm right here. My mind might be in the past. Can't do that. That's the no longer. The mind might want to travel into the future. That's the not yet. That hasn't happened yet. So we are right here right now. And the only way that we can truly know that is to pay attention, to be aware. The only way we can do that is to start to notice our thoughts, our emotions, and our physical sensations from moment to moment to moment. It allows us to gain a sense of strength and resilience and power in our own way of living. 
I'd like to do a little practice with you now. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide on. We're gonna do a little sound practice. So I would invite you throughout the rest of the time if we're doing practice to be hands-free. It's really helpful to notice when your hands are touching something also, it separates you from the direct experience. Now you don't have to do it. Nothing that I say you have to do. It's just an opportunity to practice and try it out. So this quality that we all possess is always with us all the time. It's only one breath away. Is this way of utilizing our own senses. Sight, sound, smell, touch, what we're sensing within our bodies, what we can hear. And so we're just gonna do a sound practice. These aren't special bells, I use them in my class. Generally it's uh, alarm bells because I end up putting somebody to sleep pretty regularly. So I use them to wake people up. But we're just gonna do a practice now, a very simple practice. You don't have to close your eyes, you don't have to do anything special. All I'm suggesting is that you listen to the sound of the bells for as long as you can hear them, okay? I'm gonna ring them a few times. So what did you notice? There's no right or wrong answer. You can just yell out whatever you notice with that. Now it gets really, really scary. Yeah. So you notice this wave of sound and it didn't stop for you. What else? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you brought your attention back to the sound. Other people notice that? Yeah. That's awareness. This recognition of sound, the noticing and coming back. That is the awareness practice. And that builds resilience and strength. What happens is our minds constantly are going backward and forward constantly. The coming back, the ability to return over and over again is this capacity that we have to start to notice what's happening in this moment. Now we can certainly be an automatic pilot, which many of us are, but what actually helps us is this awareness. The present moment is the only moment that we have to live, to learn, to grow, to love, to change, to heal, to transform, we can't do it in the past, it's already done. We can't do it in the future because it's not here yet. The only time is this present moment. And so learning how to come back over and over again is the practice, like I said. It is not a perfect, but the ability to practice over and over again. So mindfulness meditation is one of the ways. The mindfulness-based stress reduction course is simply the eight-week course, intensive course of this practice. But you can get an app and practice regularly if you wish. You can go online, there's plenty of courses online or classes online, I teach them in person as well. Beginning just to tap into this ability, this innate quality, this wisdom that we already possess. How many people in here have tried to meditation before? Yeah? Anybody regular meditators? Yeah, a few? Yeah. Anybody have that thought in their mind like, oh, I can't do this? My mind is always going, right? Our mind's job is to think. It is its job. So the misconception oftentimes is I'm gonna blank my mind out. I'm gonna clear it out. I wanna go relax. I'm gonna sit down and meditate and I'm gonna relax. Have fun with that. <laughs> go ahead and try and come back and tell me. Because the reality of this is the mind is going to think. We allow it to think in mindfulness meditation. What our hope is that we don't get carried away and run down the rabbit hole, that we recognize thoughts as thoughts and let them pass through the field of awareness. 
it gives us this opportunity to come back over and over again without caught, getting caught up. But we get caught up anyway. It's just part of us as natural human beings. In evolution, we need to think in order to get us where we are today. It's wonderful for discernment. It's great and wise. It's when it runs out of control. It's when we think we can control everything in our minds, we can fix and change it. But how often does that happen? You have a problem or situation in your life. We can think about it all we want, but does it change the problem or fix the problem? Oftentimes not. Right? Sorry about that. Upside down. So mindfulness is the way, one way, to change the neuroplasticity of the brain. Our natural habit patterns are well-worn grooves from the early ages of childhood. And certainly, it's not about blame or anything. It's just that we get into a natural habit pattern. My natural habit pattern is jumping to the future. I'm in the worry, thinking, anxiety category. Okay? So there's this natural way of who we are. If you're somebody who reminisces, worries about the past and things like that, that's that side of us that's kind of melancholy or depression side. I'm not saying that it's clinical. All I'm suggesting is it's our own way of this balance that we go through. So you might notice what your own habit patterns are and know what that is. So if I get a trigger, let's say I get a call from my mom who's dealing with my dad who has Parkinson's right now, which is really difficult. They're far away. I'm a nurse, adult child at home. Here in Pennsylvania, they're in Florida. Makes it quite hard. There's a lot of moments when I feel helpless and I cannot help them there. So when I see that call on the phone, immediately I get a reaction. But now I'm aware of it. My chest gets tight. I get worried. My first thought is, oh God, what happened now? He just fell and broke his hip recently. So there's, a, there's this worry there, right? So what do I do? How do I manage that? I utilize practice as much as possible in those moments. So before I pick up the phone and rip it up and start talking, I actually breathe just a few moments. I check in with how I am so that I can actually be as present as possible for, the, for her, even though there's nothing more that I can do. Oftentimes, there's nothing that we can do. So we start to surf our own possibilities, our own way of being. That is a trigger. In the past, my trigger, when I would see that phone call come through and I'd see mom on the, on the phone, after dealing with whatever situation, I would head right into the pantry and be eating. And that was the way I dealt with it. And so the reward was, oh, yeah, I feel better. I start crunching. The crunching makes me feel good and makes me re relax. But about five minutes later, shame and guilt starts to come up because I just ate a bunch of stuff that I probably shouldn't have eaten, right? I'm not that hungry. That triggers once again. So that's called a habit loop. Trigger, behavior, and reward. So how do we interrupt this? We interrupt it with mindfulness. So I'd like to do a little practice with you now, if you don't mind. We're actually going to practice formally. I'll do it standing, and you all can stay seated. It's generally done lying down, believe it or not. And for those of you who have difficulty sleeping at night, even though we try to do our best with intention to stay awake and alert, it is a very helpful practice to help people to fall asleep. So I'm going to do it in a very brief couple of minutes, but you can go online and find a body scan, that's what we're going to do, and try it out for yourselves. So the practice of mindfulness with the intention of being awake and alert. So what I would say is if you can put your feet flat on the floor, it's helpful to ground yourself. And if you're noticing that anything is crossed, fingers, hands, arms, or ankles, if you can, just allow them to rest flat on the floor. Arms just can be, hands can be flat on the, the lap if you want, or resting gently. And if you choose to, you can close your eyes. You don't have to. Allowing your eyes to close or simply falling downward softly towards the floor, resting and unfocused, returning as you breathe out. Or you might be aware of the breath in the nostrils. The feeling of air moving past the nose. And 
so now as you're ready, gently allowing your attention to move down through the body, down through the legs to the bottoms of the feet. Noticing any sensations that are here present at the bottoms of the feet, the feet themselves. You might notice the feeling of sensations of tingling or pulsing, warmth or coolness. You might notice the feeling of a sock or a shoe. You might notice some other sensation or no sensation at all. And that's okay, just knowing that. And you might find that the mind has wandered already into thinking. That's okay. Simply knowing that the mind has moved off the body and the breath and guiding it back to notice sensations at the feet. Now taking a deep inhale breath. And as you exhale, turning the attention now to noticing the hands. What sensations are vivid and present in this moment at the hands? Perhaps you notice blood flow. Maybe the feeling of fabric, the fingertips. You might even sense air on the skin of the hands. sense of aliveness in the hands. So now taking another deep inhale breath. And as you exhale, moving your attention to the face. Noticing any sensations at the face, perhaps around the eyes, around the mouth, and if you notice tightness or tension here, and you may, that's okay. If possible, simply allowing the sensations to be here. And as you breathe, softening and resting. Once again, taking another deep inhale breath. And gently exhaling. Allowing the air to simply weave the body. Turning once again to your own breathing. Riding the rhythm of your own breath. And when you're ready and in your own time, gently allowing your eyes to open if they were closed. And shifting the body in any way that feels right to do so. So what did you notice, if anything? Yeah. My mind starts to wander right away when you say that. It's kind of like it starts that way with everything. Mm -hmm. Did you hear my voice? I could hear your voice. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally normal. And congratulations, there's awareness practice right there. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more the attention time. That's why I like guided meditation, because I think you can turn a lot of people's attention to the nature of the meditation, but I do get the feeling like every time you start to do something, like if I was away, that thought would pass, and wherever it is, you just start to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So you were able to come back and forth. Yeah, so this, this way of being, thank you. Thank you both. It's just a way of being, yeah. It was funny, it was relaxing. <laughs> I was like, this is awkward and not awkward. <laughs> so you started to fall asleep? Yeah, I've done some, like, other yeah. kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. And, like, I enjoy how you did it. Thanks. Like, focusing on the things that don't have to be. Yeah, 
Thank you. You did it though. Yeah. Yeah. So you were aware of it, you kind of heard me, and you were just like, oh, yeah, there is some sensation here. Yeah, this is, this is all new, right? It's like learning a new language. Thank you. This is new. It's, it's something that you're learning, you're practicing, you're learning to become present and aware. It takes time, but you can continually come back to it. Guided meditation is helpful. Sometimes we sit in silence, depending because you get good enough at it for yourself that you begin to learn how to do this. There is sometimes relaxation or falling asleep. All of the things, all the range of emotion, all the range of what's happening in the body, everything is okay. It's also okay to not be okay because sometimes when you're practicing, things are really difficult. So this is just one way of taking care of yourself. There are many ways, but the reality is in research, when we look at the research of this practice, like I said before, we notice that at the epigenetic level, so on the genetic level, those that practice, who are practitioners, long-term practitioners, actually begin to change their genes. They decrease 150 genes for inflammation. They turn it off. And they upregulate 150 genes for anti-inflammatory. Now, we don't necessarily notice that when we're practicing. We notice other things that we're practicing, but we're talking on the genetic level, at the point of so small. And then also too, like I said, in the brain, the brain does start to shift and change. The more you practice, the area that goes to that stress part of the brain that causes quick stress reactivity when somebody says something to you and you quickly say something or somebody cuts you off in traffic and you just slam on the horn, that's stress reactivity. We all do that. We all get angry and get pissed off and get, and get upset. That's part of life. But if we have enough space in between, so from stress to response, no room. But stress to responding, if we have some space there, we can pause to check in before we behave. Kind of like I was talking about that trigger, which is the stressor, and the behavior. Give ourselves a little space, and that's what this practice does. We start to notice the areas of the brain get thickened toward the prefrontal cortex, this area of the brain in evolution that's newer. It's the area of wisdom, of discernment, of non-judgment and compassion. If we live in stress all of the time, we have chronic issues that happen to our physical bodies. High blood pressure, GI issues, you name it. Right? So this is the actual definition for uh, mindfulness meditation. And it's by John Kabat-Zinn who created the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at UMass Medical School where I was trained. And it's the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. So most of it is bringing intention like we did to the attention which we just did with the body scan as best we can in the present moment. However, we're thinking beings. Judgment does arise. Judgment is not good or bad. The issue is when it starts to run out of control. And as you were sitting here, you might have said, oh, I can't do this. I'm terrible at this. Why are we doing this? This is stupid. I'm going to fall asleep. Who knows what was coming up? All of that is part of judgment, too. Those are the ways that we can be hypercritical of ourselves, which really creates some issue. And so this practice starts to give us some curiosity, some open space to be kinder to ourselves. So when you're having difficulty at work and you make a mistake, you ever notice when you make a mistake and you're doing something, there might be a thought that's there, like, I can't believe I just did that again, an embarrassment, the emotion of embarrassment arises, and then the face starts to get flushed, for example. That's just in the moment without overlaying it with any judgment, we start to recognize, oh, everybody makes mistakes. You would say that to your own child. You would say that to a friend. We're pretty hypercritical on ourselves. And this gives us room to start to notice that habit pattern for ourselves. If we're hypercritical of ourselves, for example. So this is just a study that we did at Harvard. Um, it's now almost uh, 15 years old. 
they utilized cell phones and they started to tap in to see how attentive we are as human beings. And so they enrolled people just to use their cell phones to check in now and again to see if they were aware of the present moment. And what they found was 47% of the time we're not. We are not even aware of almost half of our own lives. We're not alive, awake to our own lives. Can you imagine? We're an automatic pilot all of the time. So it's very interesting to start to recognize how this might play into moments of stress and difficulty where we can actually gain some joy, some understanding, and start to fully live our lives. Look, we're not going on vacation every single day. Those pleasant moments are here for us. They just don't look like, you know, seven days on the beach in uh, Hawaii. But we can actually begin to find ways to fully live and find joy and, and, and peace and resilience and calm. Curious what you notice from this. What do you see? Anybody? Two faces? Does everybody see? Who sees two faces? And a vase. Some people see both. Face? Yeah. So two faces, a vase, some people see both. Oh, OK. Somebody said two vases? Or two faces? Oh, Karen, I see what you're saying. All right. It's perspective. So yeah, there's a lot of perspective here. We get into our own natural habit patterns, and we live a certain way based upon what we see, what we feel, how we were conditioned. Perspective starts to give us another way. The only way to have perspective is to know and recognize what we see, what we don't see, and who we are from moment to moment to moment. So we might have fixed ideas of ourselves, oftentimes that carry through from childhood. But is it possible to start to get a little more curious, bring some attention to it, and start to question and wonder, particularly our own thoughts, is that really true? We start telling ourselves something, is it really true? Does it benefit us? So perspective is a big part of practicing with mindfulness and mindfulness meditation. So I'm just going to go over just a little bit of stress physiology. I told you I'm kind of a science nerd, so I'm just going to talk to you about it. But we're going to do a little practice in between as well. So Dr. Sapolsky's work is all about stress physiology and stress reactivity. And the name of the book is Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And basically, what they found in studies is this. If a zebra is drinking some water, trying to like hydrate in the savanna, and a lion comes upon them and realizes, hey, there's food, and the zebra recognizes, the zebra realizes that there's danger and takes off. Off they go, right? What's interesting about that is it'll run and run and run and run, and hopefully it gets to be free and doesn't get eaten. But what does the zebra do after it's been running from danger the whole time, this massive stressor. It goes and lays down, takes a nap, and gets a drink when it needs it. What do we do? We go from stressor to stressor to stressor to stressor to stressor, and then fall asleep. We don't sit down. We don't take a break. We don't check in with ourselves. I'll give you a, an, an example of this. When I was working in trauma, I worked at a trauma center in Philadelphia. So I worked in a, in a gang unit where there was a lot of knife and gun club, a lot of head traumas and beatings. And I worked hours on my feet. Oftentimes, I would go all day and drink eh, a little bit, maybe go to the bathroom in a 12-hour period, maybe once. And then I would have to deal with all these stressors of people coming. And I would wonder why I would be getting irritated with people and anxious and angry and short. It's because I wasn't paying any attention to my own needs. And this is what happens for all of us, particularly if you're caregivers, children of adults, of anyone, of yourself. You're caregiving for yourself, and we just don't pay any attention. But the physical body can give you information. If you just feel this not-rightness, pause for a minute. Take a breath and check in. 
Even in that brief moment of taking a breath, you might just need a drink of water, you might have to go to the bathroom, you might need a hug, you might need a cup of tea, you might need to go lay down, you might need to talk to a friend. This is attention and awareness practice, which is where mindfulness comes in. We have our own innate capacity and wisdom. Our minds are powerful, but so too are our bodies. So I'd like to quickly give you a few um, things that might be beneficial, that aren't formal practice, but that may be something that you could do on a regular basis. And I do want to highlight the person who's taken our, our photography pictures back there, um, said it was OK. She is a longtime practitioner of mindfulness and sat in one of my classes, took my class quite a long time ago, I think, and still practices. She's a transcontinental um, airline attendant. So you can imagine now, post-COVID, what that looks like. Okay, I was just on an airline um, not too long ago, uh, the Monday after Easter. People's behavior out of the trauma of COVID is absolutely out of control. The expectation is that they get taken care of and don't care about the people caring for them. But Nadine and I talked briefly beforehand. She said she's still practicing and she's able to actually utilize that in times of high stress so that she can take care of herself. And now started to take off a day during a, one day during her period of time so that she can take care of herself to fill herself back up because she recognizes that she needs it. So I appreciate you allowing me to share that story. So we're going to do something called 578 breathing. We're going to do it in three cycles. The three cycles take one minute. Okay? I'm going to guide the first round, but I'm going to tell you how to do it first. You're going to breathe in for five, you're going to hold for seven, and you're going to release for eight. The release for eight is a longer breath out. We're gonna do it the second round. I'm gonna say, breathe in for five, and then I will say, hold for seven, and then I will say, breathe out for eight. And then the last one I'm gonna allow you to do on your own. And when you're done the last one, just come back to your natural rhythm of breath. You can do it with your eyes open, eyes closed, it doesn't matter. You could do this standing in the grocery line or driving. You can do this anytime. And so let's begin. We'll take in a deep breath for five, one, two, three, four, five, hold for seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, release for eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe in for five, hold for seven, release for eight, Begin again. And allowing your natural rhythm of breathing to return. What did you notice with five, seven, eight breathing? Anything? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're focused on just knowing to let it go for eight. What else? Anybody else notice anything? Yeah. So counting helped you do it. Was your mind focused on counting? Anybody else's mind focused on counting? Yeah. Where was your mind then? It's not wandering to the grocery store to do your grocery list. It's actually taking care of yourself in that moment. Five, seven, eight breath is just one of the ways that you can utilize to do this. So to wrap this up, I just wanted to share with you that Glinda, the good witch, <laughs> told Dorothy that you've had the power all along, my dear, i.e. why I have my little ruby slippers on today. But the reality of this is, with present moment awareness, with the practice and the ability of this, you can learn to live in a new way. You can become resilient and calm. These are benefits out of the practice of mindfulness. You can learn to fully engage in your life from moment to moment to moment. And through study, we know that it really induces calm. It decreases the symptoms of anxiety and depression if you practice regularly. So the benefits are longstanding. So there is a possibility. 
A Southwest airline attendant recently said, sit back and enjoy the ride or sit up and be tense. It's your choice. <laughs> so thank you all for your attention, for your practice and time. If you have questions, I think I might be at the end of my time here. So certainly I'll stay after if you have questions now. I don't know if there's, yeah, sure. Any questions of, about mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, anything we talked about today? Yeah. Yeah, there are some. Um, it depends upon the capacity of the person with a tyrannic brain injury, although I do work with some people in group. Um, it's dependent upon the ability to, to have focus without causing more stress or strain um, because it does require some effort. So there's, but there are, there are many people that, particularly with ADHD and ADD and things like that, where there's fo focus and attentional deficit areas, this practice is very good, but it depends upon the capacity of the person with a TBI. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah. Um, there's the, I guess the presence of like, um, wanting to go to sleep, like when you do the mindfulness, does that say a person is like drained or mm -hmm. is it like an attention thing or is yeah. it? Yeah, and, so tired you and you get to that point where you're just like, oh my gosh, am I, what am I doing? If you fell asleep now, it's okay, all right? So if anybody fell asleep when we were doing it, oftentimes it's that the body is just exhausted. So you get into a situation where you might have been running all day long and then the first time you sit down is to meditate, man, you're gonna fall asleep because you've been going, 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 going. It's pretty natural. The intention is to stay awake, but you might not. Also, too, if I'm working with people who have suffered trauma, physical trauma, sexual abuse, violence of any kind, oftentimes when they settle in rest and we start to put our attention on the physical body, sometimes it's difficult. So there's a sense of falling asleep. So it can be many different things. And what's interesting about it is to be able to be with, to notice, and to be okay if you do fall asleep. Because at some point, you're gonna wake back up. You wake back up to the life that's there hopefully without judging yourself that you did fall asleep, because that happens. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it's normal. It's normal. Sometimes we're exhausted. Yeah, we're sometimes we're really wiped out. Yeah. When you did the 5-7-8 breathing, mm -hmm. I'd like to just give you the 5-7-8 breathing. I've seen or heard different things, like a 5-5-8. Five, five, There's like many different, and I'm always second guessing myself if I try to do it like what wait what is it how many in how many out is is there any information about why it's a shorter breath in than hold it like is you know is that combination specific or mm -hmm. yeah and that's a it's an excellent question um you know and it's funny because I could talk it was so difficult to smash everything in in this very short period of time because this is an experiential way of being five seven eight when we get stressed, the stress hormones go up, they flood the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex like I talked about before, which sends us into stress reactivity. When we breathe in for that shorter amount of time, so pick any time that works for you, five, four seconds, whatever, the longer out breath starts to allow our body to release the epinephrine and cortisol that's in the brain. What happens, it goes offline, so we can't think clearly. So what we're doing is that outward breath you can do three breaths, sometimes people do that, a deep inhale breath, and then a out breath. That hard out breath is helpful. Mindfulness in the jail system, we do the standing with three deep breaths, or five, seven, eight, grounding into the feet so they can get your mind into the feet, a furthest place away from our head, and then that deep out breath that starts to bring down the neurochemistry out of our brains. And then just start, it's slow. But yeah, that's why it's the longer out breath. So whatever works for you, this is a practice about what fits and works for you. Yes, we do have parameters around it. Anybody who tells you to do on a mindfulness minute, think about what that might be like. I don't know how quickly you can settle. I mean, yeah, to take a deep breath in before you go in and give a lecture, for example, that's what I was doing before you all came in. I was practicing, but, and one breath is all you need. But sometimes it's difficult. But if you're getting ready to go into the boss's office, it's helpful to take a couple of breaths before that happens. Right?
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so off the cuff right now, the one that I would say, well, there's two apps that I think are great. Don't quote me on the price because I don't know what they are right now, but Insight Meditation Timer. You could go in and search mindfulness meditation. Insight Meditation Timer has uh, trained teachers on there under mindfulness meditation. All the other meditating teachers on there I can't speak to because it is a specific type. The other app is 10% happier because you're talking about many trained teachers, many, many trained teachers. The drop-in classes that you might want to sit in in a group on Zoom, I know we're all sick of Zoom, but ha believe it or not, there's some great drop-in classes. I teach one twice a month, but Brown University Center for Mindfulness, they're free. So you can just sign up Monday nights, uh, Monday nights, they're almost every day. There's also a uh, Spanish-speaking mindfulness meditation drop-in class through Brown University, I think it's on Saturday mornings. So there's a capacity for you to be able to practice regularly if you wish to, yeah. I teach at Jaya Yoga Studio on Saturday mornings up in Clark Summit. That's a, just a short half hour, so I'm not doing a lot of teaching, we're just practicing together. Um, and like I said, I teach the eight week course, which we're in the middle of right now, which is really fun. Class five, we just did stress physiology. It's fun, really fun. Do you have any other questions? I'll stay after if you do. I know you have another breakout that's coming up, but I'm certainly happy to stay. You do. Thank you all.